You're listening to Just Another Fanboy Presents The Death and Return of Superman. And this is episode number 14, The End. Hello and welcome to Just Another Fanboy Presents. I'm your host, my name is Steven, and today we glide into week number 14 of the epic crossover event, The Death and Return of Superman. And we're going to do that with Superman issue number 77. This issue hit the stands 30 years ago this week on January 19th, 1993. It had a cover price of $1.25. And the title of this issue is The End. It was written and penciled by Dan Jurgens, inks by Brett Breeding. The letters were done by John Costanza and the colorist was Glenn Whitmore. So as we always do, let me give you a synopsis, which was provided by DCFandom.com as edited by me, yours truly. As the issue opens, Lex Luthor II is in the middle of some sort of martial arts sparring session that pits himself against three women. Luther's head isn't in the match, however. His mind is preoccupied, dwelling on Superman, when one of the three women, Sasha, kicks Lex square in the jaw, knocking him on his butt. Lex is furious at the impertinence and is seconds away from lashing out at the woman who dared to treat him in such a fashion when Lois Lane and Supergirl enter, forcing Lex to restrain himself. Supergirl and Lois are there to inform Lex that Paul Westfield of Cadmus Labs has stolen Superman's body with the intent of cloning him. Lex promises Lois that he will do everything in his power to make sure that Superman is put back where he belongs. Meanwhile, Jonathan Kent has gone into cardiac arrest. Martha Kent rushes him to Smallville Medical Center where doctors labor to save his life. Jonathan has a coma dream wherein he sees his son Clark beckoning him to come home. He has visions of the past, of time spent with his son, watching him grow up. Back in Metropolis, Jimmy Olsen has a meeting with Colin Thornton of Newstime Magazine. Colin wants Jimmy to select the photograph that will be used in a Superman retrospective piece. Jimmy still cannot come to terms with the loss of Superman. Later at LexCorp, Sasha the Karate Lady finds herself alone in the women's locker room until a mysterious stranger appears, somebody that she knows, but we, the reader, cannot see, and someone who violently pulls her behind a row of lockers. Meanwhile, Supergirl flies Lois Lane towards Project Cadmus. Lois is daydreaming about Clark, so Superman leaves her near Habitat because she can't have someone on a dangerous mission who can't concentrate on the task at hand. As Supergirl flies out of sight, a pair of sci-fi, end-of-the-world, escape-from-New-York-looking bikers roar threateningly onto the scene. But after Lois explains why she's there in Habitat, they agree to help her. At Cadmus, Supergirl breaks in, recovers Superman's body, and returns it to the crypt in Centennial Park. Lex Luthor arrives at the memorial and privately muses over burying Superman once again. With no ears around to hear him, Luthor confesses to murdering Sasha in the women's locker room of LexCor. Meanwhile, back in Smallville, as the issue ends, Jonathan Kent flatlines. So let's look through this book, shall we? We'll start as we do with the cover. It is a picture of Superman flying off into the clouds where we're seeing him from behind. We can't see his face um, in the clouds. The clouds have parted. You can see the sun and that's what Superman is flying toward. I'm assuming this is representing Superman going to heaven. And uh, this is funeral for a friend number eight and triangle number 10. And it says the end. And so we open the issue. Lex is sparring with three karate women for some reason. They, they do refer to themselves later as the best black belts in all of Metropolis. But Lex's head really isn't into it. He needs a challenge, basically. He's, he's dwelling on Superman and how everything that Lex has done once Superman first appeared in Metropolis was toward the goal of 
besting Superman. As much as he hated Superman and disliked having Superman in Metropolis, there was a big part of Lex that enjoyed the challenge of coming up with various ways to either defeat or just get around Superman so he can do his criminal activities. And one of the things he's specifically thinking about is the ring of kryptonite that Lex Luthor used to wear that would allow him to be near Superman and Superman would, of course, start feeling weak and Lex could kind of get away with a lot because of that. Well, the ring itself and the kryptonite that's in the ring gives Lex cancer. And first he loses his hand and then eventually he loses his original body and he is then cloned. He has a a body cloned and his brain and eyeballs are moved into this new body. And that's the body he's in now, Lex Luthor II, posing as Lex Luthor's long lost estranged son who grew up in Australia. And it's, of course, as he is dwelling on all this, his mind really isn't into the sparring that's going on. And Sasha, or Sasha, however you want to pronounce it, she does a flying leap kick that knocks Lex to the ground. And and as Lex is laying there, wiping a hand across his face as if he's he's wiping blood away. He's like, nobody does that to me. Nobody. You have no bloody idea what trouble you've. And then he's cut off when Supergirl and Lois come in. Lois tells Lex that uh, obviously he's not his father because his father, as she describes him, that overweight old power broker, If he'd ever been drop kicked like that, he would have put the kicker on ice. And Sasha's like, hey, good thing you're not like that, eh, Mr. Luther? And Lex is like, true, Sasha, how very true. But he he doesn't look like uh, he's going to just let this pass. So then we get to a, a, a point in this book that was a bit confusing to me. And I think I have kind of figured out maybe what's going on. I, at first, I just assumed this was a situation where writers across the books weren't really talking to each other because Lois is there to provide Lex with the copy of a column that she wrote that she's planning on running, but she wants to trim it a bit and she wants Lex to read it first. And it's all about how Project Cadmus stole Superman's body and they're going to use it for cloning to try to clone Superman And she's afraid, she tells Lex that she's afraid that if she runs the story as it is, the full story, that Cadmus will see it, of course, and then they will have time to prepare a defense and deny everything and hide Superman's body and all that stuff. And Lex agrees with her, and he tells her that he'll handle it. He'll get Superman back to where he belongs. And Lois admits that that's really why she was there in the first place. She knew Lex would do something and that he really is the only man in Metropolis with enough power to actually do something and ensure that Superman gets back to where he's supposed to be. And then as she's leaving, she's thinking to herself, thank God I didn't have to run this story. If the Kents had read my story about Cadmus having their son, there's no telling what it would have done to them. And then that's when we shift scenes to Smallville and Jonathan is on a gurney with a uh, respirator and he's being rushed into the hospital. Now, the reason why I found this confusing is because in the previous issue, Superman, Man of Steel, issue number 21, that is the issue that ends with Jonathan and Martha Kent out in the field looking over the crater where Superman as as a baby or in the gestation matrix where the, the rocket crashed into their field and Jonathan is clutching a newspaper and this is where he collapses and that's the cliffhanger of that issue. But when Martha finds him out there, the newspaper he's holding is is a Smallville, uh, let's see, the Smallville Star. It's got a headline that says Tomb Empty and a sub-headline, whatever you want to call those, called Superman's Body Missing, Believed, Stolen. And Jonathan tells Martha as she comes up to him outside, he says, they've stolen his body, Martha. And Martha says, you know what Lois said when she called? She discovered it and broke the story. She swears she'll get him back. So 
This is why I was confused because in this issue, Superman 77, Lois is saying, thank God I don't have to run that story now. Who knows what would have happened if Clark's parents had read about this. And so all I can assume at this point, other than just thinking that the writers were not talking to each other and Dan Jurgens had no idea that we've already been told that the article was written and that Jonathan did read it and that Lois called them and told them about it beforehand. Uh, but still, it's what ultimately caused Jonathan to collapse out in the field. And that's why he's now in Superman 77 being wheeled into a hospital room. But if I think my way around this, I'm going to assume at this point that Lois did write an article with a lot of allusions where she's alluding to, is allusions the right word? She's alluding to the fact that, well, she's reporting that Superman's body is missing, but she doesn't say in that original article who has it and why they have it. Even though when she left Cadmus after discovering that they had his body, she left Cadmus with photographic evidence taken by her underworlder correspondent, Charlie, I think his name was. And she says that she's going to go back and write an article about this so that everybody knows what happened. I'm just going to assume that she left Cadmus out of it completely, did not mention in any way that they were going to be cutting up Superman's body to use uh, to clone him. And she just wrote an article that said, Superman's body is missing and sources tell her that the body has been stolen. And that's about all she says. That's all I can assume. Otherwise, what she's saying here in Superman 77 does not at all jive with, with what happened in Man of Steel 21. Do you agree? Disagree? Tell me what you think. Just another fanboy at gmail.com. So we're at the Smallville Medical Center. Like I said, Jonathan's on a gurney. Uh, the EMTs are bringing him into the hospital and they're, they're wheeling him along on a gurney and they're, they're yelling out, this man is in cardiac arrest. He needs attention stat. Get him into emergency. And uh, Jonathan's doctor, who happens to be there, he bursts out of a room. Uh, he says he just heard what happened. I guess he didn't happen to just be there then. He probably heard and came to the hospital. And he tries to assure Martha that Jonathan is going to be okay. Jonathan is healthy as an ox. And if anyone can pull through, it's going to be him. But Martha is, I don't, I don't know if she's no, not hopeful. I, I, she's hopeful, but she's really worried because she just lost her son. And if she loses Jonathan, she's going to be all alone out there on the farm. And that's not something we want for Martha. So as the EMTs get Jonathan into his hospital bed and they're hooking him up to machines. The doctor comes in and he's he's telling Jonathan, who is at this point in a coma or is at least he's, he's at least passed out. And he's telling Jonathan, you know, you listen to me, Jonathan Kent. You and I have been friends too long a time for you to check out on me. I want you to fight with me, Jonathan. And uh, Dan Jurgens does a really good job of transitioning from this scene into these coma dreams that Jonathan is having. So the doctor is holding his hand. He's telling him that I want you to fight with me, Jonathan. We're going to take care of that old ticker of yours. And that then transitions to Clark handing Jonathan some tools and Jonathan saying, and get it running again, Clark. And they're working on Jonathan's old truck. Clark is probably about a sixth grader, maybe at this point. He might be in junior high, but he looks like he might be uh, upper grade school. And Jonathan is just te teaching him a lesson about taking care of things and how their truck has been around for a long time, but he, he services it when it needs to be serviced. He changes the oil. He changes out the spark plugs and all that stuff. And because he takes care of the truck, the truck takes care of them. And Clark says, Mr. Ross just brought himself a brand new four wheel drive. And Jonathan says, that's because he never learned how to change plugs. He's a friend, but he doesn't know beans about taking care of his equipment. And we get basically more of transitions between Jonathan's coma dreams and what's going on at the hospital. They have brought out the, the paddles 
and they're getting ready to defibrillate his chest. And so they pull open his shirt. And as they're pulling open his shirt, we see back into Jonathan's dream where Clark Kent, as an adult, is pulling open his shirt to reveal his Superman logo. Then we go to the meeting with Jimmy Olsen and Mr. Thornton and a Mr. Washington. Mr. Washington works for the Daily Planet. Mr. Thornton works for the Newstime magazine, which uh, I'm assuming is basically like DC's version of Time magazine. They're going to run a Superman memorial issue, basically, and they are working in cooperation with the Daily Planet by getting uh, their photos of Superman that Jimmy has taken over the years. And they've asked Jimmy to pick out the cover, the picture that they're going to use on the cover. Jimmy is having a real hard time. He knows that this is not a a magazine that's going to take advantage of Superman's death or try to cash in on it, that what they're putting together here is um, a respectable memorial issue that Superman would approve of, but he's still having a hard time with it. He, he considers the photos of Superman that he's taken over the years to, they, they mean a lot more to him now. And the idea, I guess, of sharing them with the world at this point, it, it's got him feeling a little guilty but in the end, he chooses the photo that is of Superman's cape after he died there on the scene, and it's all ripped up, and it's blowing in the wind. And in fact, we'll talk about it in March, but DC put out a fake magazine, Newstime issue number one, that was a Superman memorial magazine issue, and they, they uh, included this same image as the cover of that magazine, but we'll, we'll talk about that in March. So we get to the moment where Sasha is in the locker room. The other ladies that were there sparring with her, they're leaving and Sasha's running behind and she tells them to go on to the pub. She's she'll catch up with them. And then somebody enters the, the locker room and they're trying to be really mysterious about who it is. I mean, I think we all know who it is. Of course, with the synopsis, we know that it was that it's Lex, but they're doing that thing that I've seen in, in, in many TV shows and movies where someone says her name, Sasha, and she turns and she looks into the camera, basically, and she says, you, what are you doing here? In case you didn't read the sign out front, this is the women's locker room. And I, I find it funny when, you know, they're trying to hide the identity of the person that's about to murder her. So instead of her turning around and going, Lex, what are you doing here? She goes, you, I don't know that I have ever said that to anybody if I suddenly come upon them and I know their name, you know, if, if it's somebody that I'm walks into a room that I'm in and, I, and, and, and I don't expect to see that person, you know, I don't go, you, I don't, I don't know if anybody does that, but it's used, it's, it's a trope that's used quite often in all forms of media. And it's so that we know that Sasha knows who this person is that then yanks her behind some lockers to murder her. But as the reader, we're we're not supposed to know, but we're given the clue that it's somebody that she knows. And so we go from there to a dream, a daydream, basically, that Lois is having about Clark showing back up and saying I'm she she's asleep and he wakes her up and says Lois it's me I'm back and uh she's basically just daydreaming about Clark being back in her life that he's not really dead and she she knows that he's he has done this before they thought he was gone they thought he was lost or whatnot and he's come back and then and she's pulled out of her daydream and her musing by Supergirl because she's actually flying Supergirl is carrying her and they're flying and Supergirl just kind of drops her off in the middle of nowhere outside of Habitat in freezing weather because there's snow on the ground and leaves her there because she doesn't want somebody with her who might botch up the mission, basically, because their head's not in the game. Supergirl flies off and then suddenly these two dudes appear driving these giant three wheeled motorcycle things. And... uh you know, I, I describe them in the synopsis as these end of the world sci-fi escape from New York looking guys. And that's that's kind of what they make me think of 
the type of people you'd might see in in Mad Max or Escape from New York. And the scene where they the 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 panel anyway that they where they burst onto the scene, Lois is standing there, and the, these two three wheelers just come leaping into frame. And it's a really good panel. I really enjoy this panel. I can actually hear and 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 see these these bikes or these these trikes moving and feel the rumble and everything. It's a really nice panel. I really appreciated this panel. So they basically tell her this area is wild. This area is deadly to risk dealing with us. Your reasons being here had better be good. And she says, uh, I thought the habitat area was peaceful. You guys don't look the part. And the guy says to her, we're outsiders and you, and she gives them a very brief, simple explanation. Look, I'm just passing through on the way to Cadmus. I have to get inside their installation. And one of the guys says, you're a saboteur? And she says, no, they have Superman's body, and I've come to take it back. And then the other one just immediately goes, as you should, take my bike and ride with Yango. Not only do they help her after this quick, simple explanation, one of them literally gives her his big souped-up three-wheeler and stays behind. You know, not here. I'll give you a ride. Let's the three of us go. It's uh no, here's here's my he calls it a bike, but it's a, a trike. He gives her his vehicle and then stays behind so that her and Yango can go on into Cadmus. And I guess that's kind of uh their way or the rider's way, Dan Jurgen's way of showing us what Superman meant to people. That once once uh once Lois tells them that Cadmus has Superman's body and she's going to take it back. That's all they need to hear. Superman meant a lot to them, to these guys, and uh, they're going to help in whatever way necessary. Now, <laughs> there's also a moment here that's kind of funny as, as Lois is climbing onto this big three-wheeler. Jurgens knows that if they just have her climb aboard and drive away, that the, your average reader is going to go, oh, so Lois just knows how to drive one of these things, which... It's not hard, first of all, to drive a three-wheeler. As long as you know where the throttle and the brakes are and how to shift gears. Well, I guess it can be kind of difficult. So he, he didn't want readers going, oh, okay. She just knows how to ride this thing. And so to show us that she knows how to drive it, she as she's jumping onto the trike, she says, good thing I learned how to ride cycles on all those military bases I grew up on. Those, those moments always crack me up too. Well, when Lois and Yango arrive at Cadmus. Supergirl is there. She's already taken care of business. They find her in a, a hallway and she is standing there holding Superman's body and it is wrapped in his cape. And I feel like they they missed a really good opportunity here, either just with this page because it's a splash page. They missed a really good opportunity either on this page or on the cover. We have that classic Crisis on Infinite Earths issue, the cover of that issue where uh, the original Supergirl dies and you have Superman holding her, her dead body and he's just, tears are just, he's, he's just weeping. He's unconsolable. And they could have easily done the reverse here, again, either on the cover or this page where they could have had Supergirl, granted it's not the same Supergirl, but they could have had Supergirl holding Superman's body and and weeping uncontrollably. Missed opportunity. I'm not sure why they didn't do that. We get more of the hospital and Jonathan and the doctors working to bring him back as we transition in and out of his coma dreams. We get Supergirl meeting Lex at the memorial in Centennial Park. And this is another moment in the book that had me a bit confused because on this page, we have uh, uh, one panel that just shows uh, a bit of the memorial statue. And there is a word balloon coming off panel and it says, good, Lex has finally arrived. And Supergirl then in the next panel is saying, you're late, Lex, what kept you? And he says, my garbage disposal business had an emergency. Well, I think maybe it's just the way this panel is drawn. It looks like Supergirl is floating up in the air and holding the body. But 
her cape is billowing out up over her head. So it, it, it actually looks more like she's she's dropping out of the sky. And I have to kind of wonder, was she just floating there until Lex arrived? Maybe. You know, what better way to see if somebody's coming than to go up, you know, high. But she's still holding the body, which I found kind of weird. Granted, she's not going to she's just not going to tire her out. I don't know. I just found it kind of weird. You could also look at this panel as if she's maybe standing on the ground and she's walking toward Lois and Lex, who's just gotten out of his van. But again, with the cape billowing out behind her the way it is, she would have to not be standing. It's either very, very windy or she is running toward them so fast that the cape is billowing out behind her. I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess it's not windy. Or at least it, it is windy because we can see the eternal flame on Superman's statue bent and blowing in the wind, but it's moving in a different direction than her cape is. So I don't know. I guess she was just floating up in the sky, waiting for Lex, watching to see when he was going to come. And then she dropped out of the sky when he pulled up, I guess. I'm not someone who is a superhero who can fly. So for me, that just seems like weird behavior, but. I guess if I could fly and I was a superhero, I'd probably be doing the same thing she was. Lex has driven a van because he has brought a new casket. And so he brings the casket in to the tomb and Supergirl places the body in there. Lois has an opportunity to say goodbye. And Lex asks the two of them if he can be alone with uh, Superman for a few minutes because he wants to pray. And as soon as they're out, he says, gotcha. And he tells Superman's corpse, or at least his coffin, because the, the coffin is now closed. He says, so I win. I knew I'd bury you one day, you sanctimonious, self-righteous pain. I owned this town until you came along. There wasn't a man on earth who could stop me from doing whatever I pleased. And if anyone dared interfere, they were given a one-way ticket to hell. That's the main reason I killed her, you know that Sasha witch. I throttled the life from her throat with my bare hands just to prove to you that I was king again. And then he tells Superman that when they find her body tomorrow, the evidence will lead to a janitor who works at LexCorp, who is an ex-con. And uh, he will deny, of course, being the murderer because he didn't do it. <laughs> but no one's going to believe him. And Lex says, and you can't do one blessed thing about it. You're dead. You're nothing. And I am back on top. And then we get a moment where he, as he he's punctuating what he's saying, Metropolis is mine again, Superman. And he slams his fist on top of the casket. And you are an empty, lifeless, withering husk, which then transitions into the next panel, which is the doctor slamming his fist down on Jonathan's chest. But Jonathan starts to flatline. He sees Clark standing over him in his Superman outfit and Superman is saying to him, it's me, Pa, don't be afraid. And then we get a narration box, which is supposed to be Jonathan. I'm coming, son. And he reaches out and takes Clark's hand, which then transitions into Martha holding Jonathan's hand. And she says, oh, Jonathan, no, don't leave me alone. And uh, that's how it ends. And I will be honest with all y'all. I don't remember what happened to Jonathan after this. So I'm not even going to speculate. I think I have a memory, but I'm not. I don't know if it's accurate because throughout the years, sometimes Jonathan's dead. Sometimes he's not in Superman's history. So I'm not going to speculate. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it, when we find out what ends up happening to Jonathan. Is he going to live? Is he going to die? What's what's going to happen? I don't know. But this was a pretty good issue. Um, I have to admit that the Dan Jurgens issues really just have not been my favorite. Some of them have been really, really good. Some of them have been really, really bad. Uh, on average, they're just not my favorite issues uh, during this funeral for a friend part. Now, I don't know if there's anything else I want to say about this issue um, I do want to let you know that next week is an off week. There was nothing published next week, 30 years ago in 93 in the, uh, in the event. In fact, the final page of the letters column 
uh, like the last couple of weeks, have shown no information. Next week, there is no information on Adventures of Superman number 500. In two weeks, there is no information on Action Comics number 687. But be here for Legacy of Superman number one, where the other heroes of Metropolis, Thorn, Gangbuster, Sinbad, Wave Rider, and the Guardian, try to live up to the legend the Man of Steel has left behind. And then in three weeks, there is no information on Man of Steel number 22 at this time. And in one month, there is no information on Superman 78 at this time. But be here when DC publishes our fitting tribute to the fallen hero, the Superman Gallery. But the last time we had a break or an off week, which was December the 8th between uh, the issue 8, episode 8, and episode 9, I put out a bonus episode that week, uh, but this week or, or next week anyway, during the off week, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and take that week off. So next week, there will not be an episode of just another fanboy presents. And you'll then need to join us back here on February 2nd, where we'll be looking at legacy of Superman number one. The next week following February 9th is also an off week. In fact, the, the, the following four weeks, February 9th, February 16th, February 23rd, and March 2nd are all off weeks. There were no Superman books published during that four-week period. And I don't know at this point if I'm going to put out any bonus episodes during that time. I want to. I don't want you to go four weeks without an episode. But on the one hand, I could use the time off to work on some other stuff. On the other hand, there is a lot of um, various comics and whatnot that were published uh, after the whole death and return of Superman that that kind of revisit the story. There's plenty of stuff out there I can read and talk about during a couple of those weeks that we are off. But again, I I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do because... I could go read that stuff, but I don't want to read anything that is going to clue me in on stuff that might be happening later on in the in the event. Uh, despite the fact that I, I I've read it a number of times, um, I kind of want to go into these issues each week as fresh as possible. So I, I don't know. What I can tell you is that on February second, the week after next, when when I come back with an episode episode number 15, talking about Legacy of Superman number one. I will know by then if I'm going to do an episode or two uh, bonus episodes during those four weeks that nothing was published. I could be really passive aggressive here and say uh, I'd love to use that time to have a, a feedback episode, but really haven't gotten any feedback. And uh, I guess just doing that was pretty passive aggressive, wasn't it? <laughs> so... If you do want to send any feedback in, you know where to do it. All the all that information will be in the show notes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through that again at the end of the episode. I always take up way too much time doing that. So instead, one last time, no episode next week. Join me back here February 2nd, Legacy of Superman, issue number one. And I'll leave you with that. Have a super time. Oh, that wasn't good. I've been, I've been trying to come up with closing lines that I could use, but I failed. Goodbye. I'm a little drink of water here. It was quite tasty.